That's right. Welcome home. It is so good to see you today. Our pastor obviously is not standing here right now. Uh, he has just kind of over, overcoming a sickness, so we want to be praying for him. Uh, but I'm thankful to be here today and have the opportunity to preach God's Word. And so that's what we're going to do. If you have a copy of the Scriptures, would you turn to Daniel chapter 1? Daniel chapter 1. Again, we're so glad you joined us here at first and excited for what God continues to have for us today. So I was thinking about the message and the title, if you're going to take notes, is Confidence Over Compromise. Confidence Over Compromise. And I was thinking about that word confidence. I don't know if you've had a moment in your life where you were looked to to have confidence in a situation or in a season. And I was thinking back many moments in my life, but specifically about 10 years ago when my wife Erica and I were engaged. I was thinking about our engagement. I have some friends in the room who were just engaged, and I know it's an amazing time. If you can, you're married and you think back to that day. We were in Texas, and specifically living in Houston, but the engagement happened in a place called San Antonio. Anybody ever been there before? San Antonio, all right. It is a hot place, much hotter than Houston, even in February, February 14th, Valentine's Day. It was beautiful. Uh, I had set up this amazing scene at a place called Marriage Island on the Riverwalk. If you've been to the Riverwalk before, it's very confusing, very complicated, at least I think so, and I'm pretty good with directions. And so, had this beautiful area with a Bible and roses, not bragging, okay, but it was, it was awesome, okay, just kidding. And I was really anxious, obviously, about this whole setup and situation where I was going to ask Erica to marry me. I was pretty confident that she would say yes. But the problem was, is that place is confusing, like I said, and we had been there all day. And so we finally get downtown. We're dressed in nice clothes. I'm in a, a suit jacket. Erica's in a dress because we're going to go eat at this nice restaurant. It was my kind of, uh, you know, reason for being there. And so I park about two miles away from the spot, which was a mistake, but it's the only place I could find, and it was super cheap, and I had no money, so that's what I did. And we get out of the car, and I've got my phone out, and of course this lady on the phone is talking to me, telling me where to turn and where to go, and I'm, I'm going all over the place, right, <laughs> trying to find this marriage island, trying to have the confidence that I'm not only going to get there, but I'm also not going to blow it. And just give in because I'm so frustrated that I can't find where to go. Like I literally almost stopped in the road and just said, hey, you know, will you just marry me? Because I can't. Marriage Island is cool. It's beautiful. I'll show you later. But I don't know where. I don't know how to get there, right? I almost compromised. I almost gave in. But I had to display that confidence. And that's what I want to talk about today. And so here's the key truth. Here is our big takeaway. If you don't want to compromise your faith, if you don't want to compromise your faith, you must find your confidence in the Lord. If you don't want to compromise your faith, you must find your confidence in the Lord. Now, I want us to say that together in just a second, and we're going to replace the you and the your with an I and a my. So let me do it for you to give you an example, and then we can say it together. If I don't want my, if, excuse me, if I don't want to compromise my faith, I must find my confidence in the Lord. Now let's say it together. If I don't want to compromise my faith, I must find my confidence in the Lord. Great job. So Daniel chapter 1, starting in verse 1. And this moment right here, as it would, being in chapter 1, verse 1, sets up really the entire book of Daniel but certainly our time today. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his lowercase g, false god, in Babylonia, and put in the treasure house of his God. So again, we're setting up the scene here, and I want to tell you a little bit about what's going on. So Nebuchadnezzar is a young prince, young leader, king in Babylon. 
and he's actually opposing Egypt. Egypt has made an alliance with Judah. So he's mad at Pharaoh, and he says, I'm going to go in and conquer Jerusalem because I'm upset with Egypt, so I'm going to get back at some of their people. And he goes in, and he destroys Jerusalem. He conquers. He's, he besieges Jerusalem, takes over the holy city of Judah. And it's a moment where God delivers them over. That's a key word there. Anytime you see the word delivered, in the Old Testament, it's either God delivers from or he delivers into. God delivering from is God saving. God delivering into is God giving the people over. And so if you know the cycle in the Old Testament that we've learned and we've heard for many years, as long as we've been believers, Israel falls into sin, God saves them. Israel falls into sin, God saves them. And this is part of that cycle. They've been delivered to Nebuchadnezzar. And it says there, this is important to know, because this would have been humiliating and devastating for Judah. It says that important articles from the temple were taken. So things that were very important in the house of God, where the Holy Spirit lived, were taken. And guess what? They were put in his temple of his lowercase g God. Why did he do that? Because he wanted them to see that his God was greater than their God. So already, before even talking to Daniel and his friends and the men involved, he's already saying to Israel, your God is lesser than my false God. Let me show you by putting all of these things that you are all about, that you value in our temple. And I was thinking about how Israel must have felt being in a foreign land, in a foreign culture, ripped away from what they know, from their safety, from their livelihood. I don't know if you have been out of the country before. I have only been to one place out of the United States called the Dominican Republic. I've been there four times, three mission trips, one honeymoon, all right? And uh, very different, three mission trips, one honeymoon, totally different things. But even in Punta Cana, which is beautiful, there are very different people. They speak a different language. They look different than me. They have different customs. They do very different things, celebrate different holidays, have different faiths. When you go to another country, you've probably experienced how different it can be. Maybe you've struggled with that. Like when I go on a mission trip, been there three times, like I said, it takes a little bit to get into the rhythm of the people that you're going to serve and kind of how they live, so you can become accustomed to it. And really, that's not even enough. And I imagine they feel this way, not just physically, but spiritually. How often are we in a foreign land spiritually in our lives as believers? Even if you would step up here and say, hey, I'm the strongest Christian in the room, or man, today I feel like I'm the worst Christian alive. We all find ourselves in foreign places far from God at times. And maybe that's you today. I wouldn't be surprised if there was one person here today who felt spiritually far from God. That's how Israel was. They were running. They were turning. They were not in right standing. And so God delivers over. And it says in verse 3, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court, and the officials there, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family. Nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in his palace. So Ashpenaz was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. Then listen to this. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. And they were to be trained for three years and then go into the king's service. So not only does he take the articles, shame them, say, I'm better than you, my God is better than yours, but he also says, I want the best of the nation. I want the best that they have to offer, their brightest, the future, the sharpest, the best looking. And hey, Ashpenaz, you're going to bring them in, and you're going to train them and equip them to be Babylonians. In other words, you're going to brainwash them, indoctrinate them into our culture. I want them to be the best Babylonians. I want them to forget 
Judah, I want them to forget their God, and I want them to do what we do. I want them to look like us. Not only that, but verse 5, I want them to eat our food. The food that was at the king's table was the best food. Today, we can go wherever we want to to get lunch right after this. You might be having a steak today. You might be having a hamburger today. You might be having tacos today. I don't know what's on your schedule and where you're going. You probably just started thinking about it. So zone back in, all right? But the best food there was really found in the king's palace. So you know this was good food and good wine. And he says, I want them to eat from my table. And by the way, that would have been very significant. It would have been an honor. Not something that you would turn down, to say the least. Verse 6, among those who were chosen were some from Judah. Here's who he chose. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. And the chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach. Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. Some names that you're probably familiar with. You see, that wasn't their original name. He changed it. He changes their names. And this is significant because he's not only saying, learn our culture, live our culture, eat, sleep, and breathe our culture. He says, eat from my table. But not only that, he says, I'm going to completely change who you are and whose you are. Because names were powerful and names had meaning. Maybe your name has incredible meaning. You were named what you are named today for a specific reason. Back then, they didn't just name you Joe. They actually thought through, okay, what do we want to name our child? What meaning do we want to give their life? How do we want to define their existence? So Daniel's name meant God is my judge. Pretty powerful. That'd be a cool, like, if you're Daniel in the room or watching, your name is God is my judge. But he said, hey, I want you to forget who you are and who your parents said I want you to be and the generations before you and God, but I want you to now be called Belteshazzar, which means Baal's prince, a false god. And actually, if you go and look at it, all four of them were changed to a name meaning a false god. So he's not just pouring his culture into them. He's taking their culture from them. So they could completely forget who they were. He wanted their identity. I believe that. We see that. In church, I believe that the enemy works the same way today. That he wants us to identify with the world instead of in Christ. I mean, how many of you know that? You've seen that. You believe that. You feel that pressure. That the enemy, that your flesh, the struggle that we face as believers is to identify in the world and what it offers. And not in Christ who is our Savior and our everything who we belong to. That's his attack. That's his Scheme Because he knows that we are more vulnerable and susceptible to the attack if our identity is found in something that doesn't last. In something that can't stand. And it goes all the way back to Genesis, right? Like if you go back to the original sin, I believe he attacked Eve in her identity. God said you can do anything that you want. Man, you've got the whole garden. I've given you authority. I've given you a a great command, but just don't eat from the one, just one tree. Just one. And then Satan comes in, and he says, number one, did God really say that? Did God really? And number two, hey, it's really because he doesn't want you to know everything he does and to be as powerful as he is. Hey, I'm attacking your purpose and who God said and made you and called you to be. And it starts there. So I believe we must be on alert. Because in Romans chapter 12 verse 2, what does Paul say to us? He says, there's a pattern in the world that we should not conform to. So if we're not going to compromise, one of the steps has to be, we've got to watch for the pattern. We've got to know there's a pattern. What does that look like? Let's talk about Daniel's response to know how we can do that. Verse 8, but Daniel resolved 
not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. I love how Daniel is so respectful. He's like, I- I'm not going to eat from the- You can change my name. You can call me whatever you want. You can teach me your language and your culture, but you're not going to have me eat from the table. Oh, by the way, is that okay? And he asked for permission. Did you notice that? Hey, I'm not going to defile myself this way. That word defile means to pollute or to stain. So Daniel's like, if I do this, I'm going to be polluting and staining, not, not my body, I'm going to pollute and stain my heart. Why? Because eating at that table would have meant, number one, the food was probably offered to idols and not holy to eat, not according to God's command to his people. And number two, it was a sign of agreement, of friendship, of, in this case, submission. And Daniel says, I'm not going to do it. I love the word that is used here to describe what he does. He resolves. So we've got these two verbs that we talk about. One is God delivered. Big picture, God gave Israel over because of their sin. But then there's Daniel who resolves. He resolved. Literally means to make up your mind. When you do that, when we say, I've made up my mind, we're 100%. Nothing can change it. He literally had made up his mind, 100% confidence, no doubt, this is what I'm doing. Why? Because I believe Daniel was prepared. It's really simple. He was prepared for what he was going to be served, literally. It, It wasn't a surprise. So how do we, as believers, following the same God that Daniel followed, have the confidence, the resolve that Daniel had? I believe one of the steps is knowing what's at your table. you got to know what's at your table. I've got to know what's at my table. What do I mean by that? If your table is your life, what's being served to you every day? And I could speak to every age group in this room. What's being served to you in your workplace? What's being served to you in the school? What's being served on your TVs? What's being served on your phones? What's being offered to you on your table? And are you aware? Do you know? Are you prepared? When we go to restaurants and we order food, often, not often, but sometimes, the wrong food is brought out to you. And maybe you've had that experience before where you're like, oh man, I didn't order this. And you kind of start second guessing, like, well, maybe I did. Was I wrong? If you've been in that moment, that's at least what I do. But do you know what's at your table? Because when you're in a restaurant, you're served the wrong food. We quickly know, oh, this is wrong. This isn't right. This shouldn't be in my, at my table. Well, in our life, do you know what's being served? Do you know what's being offered? Are you aware? Is it the right or wrong thing? Are you prepared to respond? Verse 9. Now God calls the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel... I'm afraid of the king who has assigned this food and this drink from the table. Why should he see you looking any worse than the young men your age? The king would have my head because of you. Daniel said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who ate the royal food, the other guys, and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. So Daniel says, hey, I've got a plan. And notice it says how God showed him favor. God showed Daniel favor because of his resolve. But he said, I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to do it. And he says, for 10 days, we'll eat nothing but vegetables and water, which isn't seen as great, as good as the king's table. And you give the other guys what's on the king's table, the best of the best. And let's see who looks better. Let's test them. And we can probably already guess, if you don't read ahead or you don't know the story, God is going to bless and honor Daniel. But Daniel showed incredible discernment and patience. How did he do that? 
I believe this about Daniel. They might have changed his name, but they couldn't change his nature. They might have changed everything about him, but they couldn't change who he was and who God said he was. So I want you to know today, church, that the enemy, that the world can do whatever they want to change your name, to change your identity, to try and rip it from you, to pressure you, to speak against you. But no one can change who you are in the Lord. You are, as a believer, a child of God. And no one can take that away from you. Some of you guys need to be encouraged today that where you are right now in your life might be hard and challenging, but nobody can change who you belong to. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are in God's possession to the praise of his glory. Listen, you were marked with a seal, church. Believer, you were marked with a seal, the Holy Spirit. You are his. And nothing can take that away from you. So be encouraged today. Find peace in that today. And here's where it ended for Daniel. Verse 15 and 16. Of course, at the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. So Daniel and the other three guys looked healthier and better nourished. Isn't that like God? They didn't just make it out. They were better, healthier, and more nourished than the king's table. God proved his point. He honored and blessed Daniel. And isn't that cool how when he chose not to compromise, how God made a change like this? Not only were the four men to eat from vegetables and water, but everybody else did. I wonder how our decision to not compromise but be confident can impact all of the people around us. Can bring change in the area God has placed you in, in the position of life that you're in, in the area of leadership you find yourself in, in your family, in your heart. As I believe as many times, many times we find ourselves in the same position as Daniel. Moments where it's so easy to give in. So I don't know what that looks like for you today. I want to encourage you right now to think about what are those compromise moments in your life. What are the moments where it's easy or tempting for you? Not the person beside you. Not the person who's lost. For you as a believer, to compromise your faith. To, to go with what the people around you are saying. To go with what social media says. To go with what feels good. To go with what, what might give you success or popularity or influence. Hey, I want to encourage you, don't be afraid to do what's right. It takes confidence. I don't know uh, what you were doing yesterday it was Saturday, and it was college football day in my house. And so some of you were probably at a football game. I was watching on TV all day long. My team played. I was watching other teams dominate, some not so much, but it was a fun day. I love Saturdays. And if you've been watching or really getting on the news in any way, you have seen the headliner in college football, and that is Colorado. That is Coach Dion Primetime Sanders. And so I was scrolling through Instagram, and a, a, an Instagram called Sporting News brought this video up, as it does, you know, in the algorithm of social media. And so I just want you to watch what Coach Sanders says here. 
I've been doing this for a long time, for years. So when we go down from the 40 to the goal line, I'm dad, you know, I'm making sure he's straight, how's he feel and all that. I'm, I'm the father. When we touch that goal line and come back, I'm the coach. Now, this is what I want, protect the football, you know, see it. Uh, no late throws out in the middle of the field. Get everybody involved. Keep your line energized and, and, you know, take care of yourself. Don't do nothing stupid. Don't run. If you're going to run, slide because we need you. Okay, <laughs> such like that. Then it always ends with let them know. I want them to know our last name before we walk off this darn field. Oh. And who are you? He said, I'm a Sanders. I said, all right, let's go show them what we know. So I love that. And the band can start to make their way to the stage. I love that interview or that word by the coach because here's what he's saying. His son, if you've been following, is the quarterback of the team. And he's talking about the moments before the kickoff and how they spend time walking to the goal line and back. And on the way down, he's, he's dead. He's, hey, I love you. I'm proud of you. You're going to crush. You're doing a great job. But on the way back, he's coach. Walking back, he's, hey, don't mess up. Hey, you're the leader. Hey, if you run, you need to slide. That's important. But I love what he says at the end. And y'all, it caught my attention. He says, before we are finished, hey, let them know. Let them know who the name is on the back of your jersey. Let them know who you belong to. Let them know who you represent. And church, I thought about us. I thought about when we step on the field of life, and we got to let them know. We got to let them know the name that's on our jersey because the name on your jersey isn't your name. It's not my name. It's the name Jesus Christ. We're on his team. So we got to let them know. We got to step on the field and be confident and bold. Say, man, I know there's moments I can compromise. I can give in. I can second guess. I can give up. But I'm going to choose right now to be confident in Jesus. In the fact that I belong to him, no matter what anybody else says. If I've given my life to him, I am his. I'm his child. I've been adopted as a son or a daughter. I'm different. So church, would you let them know? That's how we make a difference. That's how we make an impact. Is when people look at our life, we say, hey, don't look at me. Look at him. Look at the cross. Because man, confidence begins at the cross. That's where it starts. And that's where you got to go back to. It's not just, I'm going to the cross and God, I'm going to give you everything. Okay, well, I don't need the cross. I'm out. No, you got to come back to it. The foot of the cross. You got to live there. Confidence over compromise. Would you pray with me? Jesus, today we love you. We praise you for who you are. You are great. You are wonderful. You are so worthy of much more than we can offer and we can give. As broken, imperfect people who are hurting, who are challenged, who are sinful, And right now, as we begin to respond, God, I pray you would convict us by the power of the Holy Spirit. You would draw us to the cross. From the person in here who doesn't know you to those in here who have given you everything, we all need the cross. We all need our Savior. So would you do that in our lives today? As we continue to pray, and in this moment, I want to ask you, what decision do you need to make today? That's our question. That's our response. What decision do you need to make today? We're going to have a time where you can do just that. You can answer that question. You can respond where you are at the altar, speaking to a pastor, a leader down front. We would love to do that, to talk to you more about, hey, confidence starts with knowing Jesus. Maybe you don't know him. Today, you got to do it. Today's the best day. Today's the right day. Give him everything. Surrender. You won't regret it.
Maybe today you're being tempted to compromise and you need to come clean and say, Lord, I just want to confess this to you. I want to declare it and I want to move past it. Would you help me? Would you strengthen me? Would you fight with me? Maybe you need to know what's at your table and you need to take an inventory of what's being served today. Would you do that? Maybe for you it's being reminded whose team that you're on. So as we respond, let's answer that question. Again, the 120 seconds are such a time to kind of marinate in God's word, knowing that that we don't want to leave the same way that we came today, whether it's coming to the live stream or coming to our auditorium. We pray that you've been affected by the power of the word of God. Maybe it's stirred some questions. You want to talk to somebody, ask some questions? Let's discover those answers together at 877-443-CARE. Or maybe you just need to talk to God. Maybe you realize that this gift of, of salvation is there for you, but you hadn't accepted it. You can do that with a simple prayer, and I would love to lead you in that prayer. A prayer to start your life in becoming a family member, a part of the family of God. You can repeat after me or just say, me too, God. Lord God, I know that my sin has separated me from you, so I I turn my back. I repent from my sin, and I ask you to come in and control my life. Lead me. I surrender to you, Jesus. I do believe that you are the Son of God. I believe you died, rose from the grave, and I believe you can give me a new life, a a new beginning, and I ask you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you did that, rededicate your life to Christ or gave your life to Jesus for the very first time, let's talk about it. We've got friends right now, matter of fact, 24 hours a day at the other end of 877-443-CARE. You can call or text. We would love to not only celebrate with you, but also give you some resources like our daily encouraging word Bible guide that'll help you grow in your faith. Lots more than that. Just let's get connected. 877-443-CARE or online at tewonline.org.